So if you'd like, go ahead and open up to the book of Job. We're going to take a lesson from the book of Job. I'm going to start right out looking at it. It's actually, I got an error up there. It's uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Chapter 1, starting in verse 6. We're having some internet problems, so we're not live streaming right now. Um, the lesson is being recorded. And then after services, I'm going to go ahead and upload it. So for those who happen, I know, like Linda, hasn't been able to. <laughs> Another thing, I don't know if we, I told Jack for the announcements, but we're going to go back to 945, 945 for Bible studies like we used to. So I'm going to really try to get that out, 945, and go back to the normal hours. So those who are attending are attending anyways, but just to let you remind you that. Um, so let's go ahead and read Job, starting in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and walking up and down and on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth, blameless and upright man who fears God, turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? Have you blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land? But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This sets the stage for one of the biggest challenges in the Bible that we read of when it comes to people who are faithful and loving God. One of the things that I see in this is that there's basically two questions that we have to try to answer as we look at this. Is Job's faith going to triumph over his experience? That's what's being set up in this scenario. That's the question. Or is his experiences going to triumph over his faith? And that's a question that we have to deal with all the time, isn't it? Is our faith able to triumph over the experiences that we have in our lives? Or do our experiences overwhelm our faith. One of the things that is fascinating to me is that this is a story that has been set on the world stage. This moment comes together. Think about it. If we go back and look, this is probably Job is, is, is a contemporary of Abraham. So we're talking about right after the flood, a few hundred years or so, and we have this amazing encounter fascinating when you think about the idea that Satan's walking around and he's, he's walking around and he's looking. But you notice that he hasn't been able to do anything. He hasn't been able to touch. And God brings up the fact. It's almost like he's, he's saying, look at the difference. Because I'm sure that Job wasn't just, he wasn't the only one, but God says, look at Job. Have you seen my servant? Well, of course he's seen his servant. There's a part where it's as if, you know, yeah, and he's a spur in my side. And God is saying, look at this. And, he, and, and it's, a battle is set here on the world stage. You know, I think about whenever Jesus was born and how the angels came out to look and they wanted to so much be involved and see. And we know other places where it says that angels yearn to look into it. I can see this confrontation being set up. And here is all the heavenly creatures looking. Job. What's going to happen? Can he do it? If we go all the way back to the garden, the last time that Satan had an encounter that we can know of in a conversation that's written, it didn't go so well, did it? He fell. And now we have another encounter. And it's going to set forward such a precedent for all of mankind. What I think is so amazing 
This is the last time we hear Satan's voice recorded in the Old Testament. Job is triumphant over this. And Job never knew necessarily what was going on. There's a lot of things that we see that are similar. But one of the things that is interesting about him when we first meet Job is his, is his character. And that we didn't go back and I didn't read that, but when we look at that, some of the things that we see is, first off, he's blameless and upright. Not perfect. That's something we always assume that automatically that puts him out of our character. He's just not something we could relate to. But he's blameless before God. He's following sacrifices. We see that when we read the very first part of chapter 1. How he is constantly, even for his own family, that he is concerned. He's blameless and upright. He fears God and he turns away from evil. Isn't that what James said? James said, flee temptation. Turn and run. We've got to guard ourselves. Job was that type of a man where he saw things that were evil, he knew what they were, and he turned away from those things, away from them. He had seven sons and three daughters. A great family. Now, they were a typical family, I'm sure. You know that Job had struggles. There's not a family that we can ever read about, in the, even in the Bible, where everything was just perfect but among the children. But they, they did have a habit of coming together. They came together, you know, once a week or so, and they, they shared a common meal and stuff. And it seems like even while they were doing that, Job was spiritually concerned about them. And they called it, put them under the blood. That's an old phrase I just learned. Referring to, in other words, as he would offer his sacrifices for the family, that he would do this for them as well. He had 7,000 sheep. 7,000 sheep. When you think about how many sheep that is and what were they using sheep for? He's the wealthiest man around. All the clothes, the products that were being made from those sheep, along with probably sacrifice and stuff. 3,000 camels. You know what that's like? That's having like 3,000 trucks out on the highway. I don't know how many Royal Jones has, <laughs> you know, from the Sea Valley Transport. He's got a bunch. I probably maybe 3,000. You can't go anywhere, can you? I, I've been traveling into Louisiana, and did you see any? <laughs> when Jack was up in Tennessee, you can't help but see one of those trucks from a Sea of Valley transport. Job had 3,000 camels, and they were busy. We see that he had 500 oxen. Oxen to plow fields. He's diverse. He doesn't have everything invested into one thing. He has sheep. He has the camels. And he has them out transporting goods to and fro around the area. And he has also ox and agriculture and farming. He has female donkeys as well. And this is during a time when people looked at wealth as a sign of spiritual blessedness. We know that because we read the encounter, the conversations that Job has with his friends. And we know that it goes on. Many times today we see that. People look at people and they go, oh, well, you must be suffering because there's something wrong with, between you and God. The Jews struggled with it as well. They asked Jesus, you know, this man's blind, who sinned? So he has this great wealth he has this beautiful spiritual relationship with God. He has no clue what's coming, does he? He has no clue. Throughout the entire encounter, Job does not know what's going on in heaven. That this is something that he needs to be prepared for. He you need to be ready for it, Job. Wouldn't you like to know that? If you were going to be thrown into the situation like Job, wouldn't you like to just have a little bit of a note Ron, it's fixing to get you. But Satan is telling me that you're going to do that. And so here, I'm going to help you through this. No. No. Job doesn't know. That's why I say this is one of the greatest encounters that we see on the world stage. And Job is the focus of it. And all the heavenly creatures, everybody in heavenly realms are watching Job. What are you going to do? 
Is it true? If all your wealth is taken away, will you curse God? If all these things you lose? What I found also interesting is in that conversation that he has, Satan's got it right. He says, he goes, yeah, well, haven't you protected him? Haven't you put a hedge around him? Have you not blessed him in his hands? Yeah, that's what God does. Absolutely. So why do you got a problem with that, Satan? That's what God has promised. He will take care of us. And then he turns it and says, yeah, but you take that away from a man and he will curse you. So I can see Job one day going to wherever he does business. And all of a sudden, here comes a messenger. And the first one arrives and disaster starts in verse 14. And then that messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans, they fell upon them and they took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And alone I have escaped to tell you. And while he's talking, another messenger comes in. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and he burned up. The sheep and the servants consumed them and consumed them, and I alone have escaped. The day's going really bad for Job. He woke up that morning thinking, what a wonderful day. God is good. God has given me all that I have. Blessed family. And back to back, it's already showing. He's losing everything. And while that messenger is talking, another one comes into him and says, and yet while he was speaking, there came another messenger and he said, the Chaldeans formed three groups and they made a raid on the camels and they took them and they struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to come and tell you. I don't know, but I was kind of thinking, what's going on? And why is it that every one of these catastrophes, the best part of it was, you live to come and tell me this. Every one of them. It's like the same thing, the same thing. When you have those kind of happenings in your life, and they seem to come like that, and no matter what happens, no matter what you're doing, you always seem to get this message, and then then another one comes, and then another one comes. But it's okay, you know, I mean... It's just things, right? I can get more donkeys. I can get more sheep. That's okay. But then another messenger comes. And yet while he was speaking, another one came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are all dead. And I alone escaped to tell you. So now he's lost financially everything. Now he has lost his his inheritors. And and think of Ben. You know, I mean, a part about when you grow old, not only do you have this financial security in all your wealth, but another part of it is you depend upon your children. Your children are part of this to give it all. And now he's just losing after that. And he knows that he's upright. He knows he's doing things right with God. When does doubt creep in? When do you start to have that start to come in? And his response to tragedy is something that is so remarkable. and something that we should look at and consider when we think about it. In verse 20, then it says that, Then Job arose and he tore his robes and shaved his head and he fell on the ground. And what did he do? He worshipped! And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord give, and the Lord has shall take away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with a wrong. Could we do that? Can we honestly? After experiencing? Okay, one thing. I lost all the the sheep and all the wealth and all these things, financial devastation. But then to lose your children and to fall down and worship 
fall down and to worship was his response. I'm ashamed to tell you. I don't know that I could do that. And I think that's the challenge that most of us have. That when we have not even half the day that Job had, would we have the spiritual strength to turn and to worship God and to understand? That's the other part. He understood very clearly where it all came from and where it all go and what it was all about and what the importance of it all was. I think we're entangled in this world really tight. And it makes it very difficult for us to be able to have this type of response. Can it get any worse? You would think, well, I don't know. You know, can it get worse? That's what I always ask. I always think, you know, don't you have those days where you go, man, this is a really bad day. Can it get worse? Don't ever ask that question, by the way. Don't. (laughs) Because Job is at a point, and then he goes back, and we know there's another conversation between Satan and the Lord. And in that next engagement, we find almost the same type of conversation. The sons of men are gathered, and here comes Satan. And the Lord looks at him and says, where have you been? He goes, well, I've been going to and fro and all this. And the Lord says almost the exact same thing. He says, have you seen my servant, Job, blameless and upright? And the Lord says, and you know what? He didn't curse me. Satan's always got a response, doesn't he? And so when this day, when he comes in and presents, he says, he said, I've been out there, and I'm jumping over to verse 3 and 4 of Job. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on earth, a blameless, upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and he said, Skin for skin, all that a man hath, he will give for his life. That's a true statement. There's some truth in that. Most people of this world, (laughs) they will do anything to cling to life. But God's people are different. But stretch out your hand, Satan said. Touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to his face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand. Only spare his life. Job doesn't see this happening. He doesn't know what's being talked about. He doesn't know that he is representing the result of, And his life is about those who love God and are are faithful to God. All he's seeing is at one moment he has been so blessed because he's been right with God. And now all of a sudden everything is wrong. And Satan is pushing it again. So we have something here for us as well. When we look at our material wealth and all that we have and we've been blessed with. And then we have now the next phase which is really our physical health which many are challenged with. And the older we get, the more we're challenged with our abilities to get around and not suffer. We have some of our own number here. Cannot even come to church anymore because of physical problems, medical problems that are going on. They're struggling with that. And I just wondered about that. I watched my own grandfather go through that, where he couldn't go to church. He was paralyzed and and, and wanted to go to church so bad. And I thought, how can you be so happy And there's a little bit of Job in those righteous men and women that you see that is so uplifting. So Satan goes out. He went out from the presence of the Lord and he struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which he scraped himself while he sat in the ashes. Can you get any pain relief from that? What do you tell a doctor? And they didn't have the medical technology we have. How do, you, how do you seek type of medical help for that and relief? Even today, this condition would be extremely difficult to receive any type of relief from suffering. Even with our technology today, nobody really knows what this is. 
But I know that if you were to imagine what he is going through, can it get any worse? You know, one of the most precious things that the Lord has done for us is to provide us companions. So that when we have these difficult times, that we can lean on one another and we can hold fast to each other. And we know that Job's wife is a spiritual woman. It's a part of his family. All that he's been blessed with. But even her, it took a toll to see all her securities lost. And then all of a sudden, to watch your husband go through this, you can't help but be resentful. This happens as well, doesn't it? We see this happen a lot. And his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Does this sound familiar? This is the exact same words that Satan said to God. That that's what he will do. When you harm him this way, he will curse you to your face. And this is coming from your wife. And I love his response. Shall we receive good from God and not receive evil? And again, in all of this, Satan did not sin. Satan, sorry. Job. Job did not sin. How would we fare with this type of a condition? And we all have. You know, whether it's to the extreme of Job or not, we, we have our own challenges with this exact same. And that's why I say that this was such an amazing engagement between God's people and Satan. And that the angels and everybody in heaven were sitting there watching this, yearning to see. Was Job going to pull through this? And he did. And then really we come to the next phase. Now, You have everybody in society looking at you. Everybody around already bringing judgments. And like I said earlier, if it's about the spiritual blessings that why people think that you're rich and if you're you're failing, then there must be something wrong spiritually with you. Then what are people automatically thinking? Oh, that Job. My, how he has fallen. And how do you think Job feels about himself? How do you not have some of those doubts? So Job looks up and he's got his friends coming to comfort him. The best thing they did, by the way, is the first seven days is they kept their mouth shut. I, I love that. Because I think sometimes there's nothing you can say. I don't know enough about your actual suffering. And so his friends come. And his friends heard of all the evil that had come upon him and they came from each his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bilidad, the Shuite, Zophar, the Naamathite, and they made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. You notice where they're from? The, this shows as well the extent and the region, how far that Job's reputation was. These are all men from different tribes that are coming together. And their purpose as good-hearted as they thought, was to provide him comfort. comfort. Eliphaz was, was, was the spiritualist. He's the one that had all these exotic type of experiences and stuff. He suggests, doesn't come out and say it, but in his conversations, he must be sinning. He says to Job in 4.7, Remember who, was that, who that was innocent ever perished? He's reminding him, have you ever seen somebody that was right perish? Associating again the idea that somehow, Job, you need to see this. I'm not going to call you a sinner, but I'm, you need to think about this because have you ever seen this? Or where were the upright cut off? So automatically, so, and Bilidad, he comes along and he supposes he was a sinner. He kind of positions it. He's got all sorts of 
little cliches in his conversations that he says. And it's hard when you read through those conversations, if you study them. It's really hard because you look at those and you go, you know, there's a lot of really solid stuff they're saying to him. But so misguided, just out of context and not knowing what they're talking about. But they were knowledgeable. He says to him in chapter 8, verse 3 and 4, he says, Does God pervert justice? Job, this must be just. Or does God, or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children have sinned against him, he has delivered them into the hand of their transgressor. Job, you got what you're coming. This is what you deserve. And then Zophar, he's a sinner. You are sinning. It's so obvious. Why can't you see this, Job? Why can't you not see this? He says, if anything, you deserve more. When he says that in 11, chapter 11, verse 6, he says, Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Job, you're getting off light. These are your friends. Job replies, and he goes back and forth, and the, most of the book is around this, these conversations. And, and very enlightened, back and forth, and you hear these responses. And, and like I said, they sound so wise. They sound right. It's hard to, to argue even with his friends and some of the statements that they make. And Job, no matter what he comes back with, they have a response to try to point out again, Job, this is your fault. You've had something to do with this. You need to own up to it. It kind of pushes him into a corner. A lot of times we allow that to happen during our suffering times when people approach us. Sometimes we allow that, that pressure to force us into defending ourselves in something that we don't know. Job doesn't know what's going on. He just knows the suffering that he's experiencing. There's something greater going on. Something far greater than you or I will ever understand. And Job replies in verse in chapter 16, 12 and 14. In talking to them, he says, I wanted to share this part because I think it helps express what Job is saying. I was at ease, and he broke me apart. He seized me by the neck and he dashed me to pieces. He set me up as his target. His archer surrounded me. He slashes open. He slashes open my kidneys and he does not spare. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with breach upon breach. He runs upon me like a warrior. Can you blame him for saying this? I mean, Lord, you put him in that position. You give him a little mercy in that? It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Lord. I would never want to be Job. In the many, many ways, but this part right here is where I think would be one of the most challenging is to then fall into the hand of the Lord. And so the Lord comes back in chapter 38 and says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, and I will question you, and you make it known to me. How, that, that's bone chilling to me. You know, when you think about the idea, when he says, Who is this who darkens wisdom, who thinks that he knows all that's going on? Okay, stand up. Get dressed and prepare yourself. And come teach me. And he asked him some questions. Job 38, 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Then he asked, Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loosen the cords of Orion? You know, in that statement alone, nobody understood or comprehended all that God said in just that one statement. Talk about astronomy. 
gravity, understanding about how the forces of planets, the loosening, when he talks about that, can you change the gravity to where that Orion and Pleiades would change? Can you take that glow out of it? Can you, Job? Do you know how it even exists? No, of course not. Matter of fact, we don't even know. We've been watching that uh, on, on apologetic press and stuff and all this stuff, and there's this black matter and dark energy and all these things going on out there. And when, right, when we think we know something, we learn something else. And as smart as we are today, there's still so much we do not know. And here's Job being asked this question. Do you, can you do that? In 40, verse 1 and 2, then the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like His? We would never want to say this out loud. But when things happen to us, there's a lot of times that we are trying to find fault with God. We do. Sometimes we turn out. A lot of people do. But wait a minute. Job, when we go back and look, he never sinned. But what happened? When you read those conversations, you can see that Job was struggling. Struggling with this concept. Struggling with what's going on. He may have maintained righteousness and maintained being blameless and such, but within his spirit there was a challenge that was happening to him. And then Job repents. In chapter 42, verse 6, he says, I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. He finally just, it, he got it. He understood. No matter how much we suffer, no matter how much we're going through, we will never truly know the bigger picture. We will never be able to comprehend what God is doing for us. We will only seem to see what God is doing against us. And like I started out this lesson in saying, is his faith going to triumph over this experience? Or was the experience going to triumph over his faith? And that's our question. We continually need to ask ourselves as we go through life. He despises himself. He sees what he has done. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when... Look at that. Look at that. When? When did he do this? When he prayed for his friends. Have you ever noticed that? It wasn't just that when he repented, but it was when he was also praying for his friends. You see, God turned on his friends too, and he corrected them. And all that's going on, that's one of the most beautiful things you see about the preciousness of a righteous soul, is that they see others before they see themselves and, want, and care about them. And he reaches out to those worthless comforters that came up, they called themselves friends. And that's when the Lord restored him. In chapter 42, verse 10, it says that the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Twice as much. And that's great. I mean, when we meet him, we find out that before, he had 7,000 sheep, after 14,000 sheep. Wow. Wow. 3,000 camels. Now, 6,000 camels. Talk about producing wealth. Before, 500 ox. Now, 1,000. 500 female donkeys. Now, 1,000. Seven sons and three daughters. Seven, wait a minute. Is there something wrong with this? Do you see that? That's not double. Lord, I, I, I hate to break in here, but, and I'm no mathematician, but I can look at those numbers and that's the same. So what's going on here? You see, 
He had seven sons and three daughters before. All those things that he had in the physical world, he lost. Notice that? He lost them. He never lost those seven sons and daughters. He knew where they were at. The Lord didn't destroy them. Do you remember one of the things that Job did for his family? He put them under the blood. One of the things he did was that he would pray for them. Yes, the physical world, he lost them. And then the Lord gave him another seven sons and another three. And when, the, when Job passed away, and that generation passed away, when Job looked around, you know what he saw? Fourteen sons and six daughters. The Lord was true. A greater blessing. If life would have went on, all that material, the camels, <laughs> the donkeys, okay, great. But it's all animals. But those seven sons and those three daughters was his heritage that he was passing on. It was his legacy of righteousness and everything about him. His grandchildren and great-grandchildren were to come through him. His seed line, everything that he was about, that he was working in righteousness, were through those children. And then, so I want to come back to this idea of a phrase that was said. He asked him, he said, you know, Lord, Satan said, but you put a hedge around him. Now, I, you know, I just got a little visual on that and started thinking about it, and I thought, why not a wall? Why not a wall? I mean, if the Lord put a hedge up around your house and you had enemies around you, all around you, wouldn't you want to go ahead and put a fence in there to help? Do you think a hedge is really going to stop all the enemies and things that can come at you? No. A hedge is thick, yes. It'll slow down a lot of it. We want a wall. <laughs> we like walls to be able to feel like we're secure. But the Lord provides a hedge. Life, still we experience it. Job still experienced things that were going on. The hedge didn't stop everything, but it did protect him the way the Lord knew how to protect him. Everything about this story comes back to this idea. We don't know what's going on when it comes to the Lord. But what we do need to know is staying faithful and loving God with all our heart. Trying to remain blameless and upright is something that's so important to remember. And that we have the courage that when we're facing some of these problems that we are like a Job that we worship. We don't regret, moan, cry, that we worship and praise God. And remember that everything of this physical world is His. Anyway, the Lord has brought us in this world with nothing, and we will depart with nothing. Wait, except for one thing, your soul. And that is the most precious to the Lord. That's why I say it's so interesting as well that the fact that you never have another recorded conversation of Satan in the Old Testament. Never again. That's how decisive. Not until Jesus comes, right? Then we see this encounter and the same thing. It's a shadow. That's those shadows we talk about. Job was a shadow of our Messiah. The great things that he suffered, that he endured, but yet did not sin yet turned his trust to him. Even when Satan came directly to him. See, Job didn't have to even see Satan. He didn't have to deal with him. Our Lord and Savior did. I hope this has been something that will encourage you when you're struggling as well. If there's somebody here tonight that we can help you with in your relationship with him, I hope that you will take a moment and think about it. Be encouraged about Job. Just think about that the Lord was always in control of it all and that He is always going to take care of His own. 
So if we can help you at all, whether establishing a relationship as a Christian by being baptized, or if we can pray for you, please let us know. And let's think about it. And if you're comfortable, you can come forward while we stand and sing this invitation song. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, <clears throat> watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. Time is now fleeting, the moments are passing, passing from you and from me. Shadows are gathering, life's end is coming, coming.